Joining us right here back on the Rich Eisen Show. It's been about a month, so it's been too long. Uh, senior producer at NFL Films, who is um, outstanding at evaluating talent, as well as those during the season after looking at some film. Uh, he's Greg Cosell. How are you, Greg? Rich, uh, great to be with you. And I love what you said about NFL Films. Since it's the uh, truth. You may not know I'm the longest tenured employee in the company, so uh, it was very nice to hear what you said. You are. I know you are, Greg, and it, it's the truth, man. It's the truth. And I get emotional every time I think of Steve Sable, every time I hear his voice, as I will tonight um, on the Hallmark before the uh, before the Thursday night football game, certainly because, you know, I'm a, I'm, a good, uh, I'm a good teammate, so I watch it on, on NFL Network, and I just hear his voice. When did you first meet him? When did you? I, I didn't think oh, we'd God, start here. Well, but let's, this is let's my go 41st here. season, Rich. So I've been with with the NFL for literally 40% of the NFL's existence. So this is my 41st <laughs> season at film. So I met Steve when I uh, when I interviewed back. Let's see, I started on July 23rd, 1979. So I probably met him in, in May or June of 1979. No kidding. And so what was your yeah. first gig there? Well, back then it was a much smaller company, so for right. the first year or so, you basically were in training. So you just, uh, you know, it, it was a different world, obviously, in 1979. Um, so you were in training for a year or so, and then for my first number of years, I, I worked on, we did the game of the week. We had something called the Army Monday Night Game, which was about a 10-minute breakdown of the Monday Night Game that we did. And uh, I worked on those, and you worked all night on those. That was sort of your... your uh, uh, your starting point. So I'd be up all Sunday night and all Monday night, and that's that's kind of how I started out during my first season. Well, I mean, and were you? Did you just like walk down the hallway and there was Facenda in the break room or something like that? Or, or what do you? Well, think? it's funny you mentioned Facenda because I was the last person to work with John before he passed away. We actually had to go to his house out in suburban Philadelphia, right? And um, he was the greatest guy. I don't know if you ever got a chance to no. meet, you know to meet him. You're you're a little younger than I am, Rich, but. Uh, um, he was just an unbelievable guy, and and he would he about him. And if you gave him a great script, he'd always say, "You gave me a great horse to ride." <laughs> <laughs> I would make uh, that my ringtone if if the you know if the, yeah. if the, if the generations actually lined up technologically. That would you gave me. A great... I was fortunate to hear that once or twice, so that made me feel really <laughs> good because I was young in my career, and he was the master. Uh, you know, because that was back in the day when local news was different. I mean, sure. John Facenda was the Walter Cronkite of Philadelphia News. Right. You gave me a great horse to ride. Uh, that's fantastic, Greg. Oh, man. So, all right, let's get to the here and now here. Um, I, I don't know if it's feasible for you to answer this, but I'll ask it anyway, because the story that came out of yesterday's show that so many people are talking about right now is the answer that Lamar Jackson gave me yesterday. <laughs> When I asked him, you know, why are things not coming as easy for you? It doesn't look it's coming as easy for you. And part of his answer was he says that the defense is calling out a lot of their plays. Does that look like something you're seeing on film or tape? Well, that I certainly can't speak to because I don't right. know the answer to that. But here's what I will tell you. Last year was obviously Amar Jackson's first year as a starter. And Greg Roman and staff were very creative and innovative in their run game concepts. They took basic run game concepts, Rich, and they blocked them in different and creative ways. So what did teams do all this off season? Particularly division teams, but certainly when the schedule came out, every team that was on the Ravens schedule. And unfortunately, because of the pandemic, I bet coaches had even more time to do this kind of work. So what they do is they figure out how to defend this. They figure out keys. They figure out looks. They, they figure out the things coaches deal with on, on pretty much a daily basis. And then what you have to do as an offense is you then have to adjust yourself. And I can only speak to the film, right. but I will tell you this based on film, and I've spoken to other people about this, that right now – their pass game, which is something they're going to need to improve to get where they want to go, their pass game is pretty limited. And when I say limited, I mean in terms of the pass game concepts. Uh, you could even use the word remedial at this point, which is a word that's been used to me, and clearly the film shows that. So I think they're at the point where they now need to, to make some adjustments and figure things out. They'll always have games where they, they do really well because Lamar is a freakish athlete and we know how well he can run. Right. And, and there are certain things they can set up. 
but they're going to have to expand their pass game to get to where they want to go. So do you would you view the the acquisition of Des Bryant being something that the uh, coaches clearly see what you're talking about too? I mean, again, John Harbaugh's a, a, a coach of the year. Um, no question. On his oh, resume. no, John's so, great. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, so it's not like we're we're probably telling any tales out of school about what they see themselves. I'm just wondering if Dez is an answer because any Ravens fan out there that would hear you say this might say, then what is the answer? How do you become less remedial uh, in the middle of an NFL season? Well, it also comes down to concepts. I mean, it's always good to have better players, no question. Um, but I think it also comes down to what they do in terms of their pass game concepts. Because, look, they drafted Marquise Brown a couple of years ago, and here was the thought process. The thought process was that teams will play Lamar Jackson in the run game with extra people in the box so that they will almost always play with a single high safety. And you'll get a speedster like Marquise Brown, and on the outside what happens is he gets one-on-one and he can run by people, and you'll create big plays in the passing game. We haven't really seen that kind of offense. So it's not just a matter of getting better players. Let's assume Des Bryant is at his absolute best. He's a very good receiver, but it's how he is used within the context of, of their offense. So last one for you on this then, Greg. is it, it, Can you see, you've watched enough film and tape of your entire existence, can you see something where you're like, okay, it, it sure looks like the defense knew what was coming? Or, or, or sensed it. Can you can you can um, you see something like that? Again, that's that's hard to answer. You know, I would I would just in some ways reiterate what I said. I think that defenses have a better feel for the concepts that they're running, and they need an expansion now. They need to build off their concepts, which, by the way, all good offenses over time do. Yes. You, every offense has foundational concepts. It's how you get to them, and it's how you build off of them. That's what really good offense is about, because there's not a thousand concepts, Rich. You know, it's just like people, you know, think that, oh, there's a thousand pass game concepts. No, there's not. But it's so it's how you get to them mm-hmm. and how you build off of them. Greg Cosell, senior producer of NFL Films, the longest tenure uh, at NFL Films, joining me right here uh, on the Rich Eisen Show. What does Tua's first two games tell you? Well, I thought that this week was just a phenomenal job by Chan Gailey. Two is a certain kind of player. I, we've, I think we've had this conversation. He's yes. incredibly rhythmic. He's got really quick feet on his drop and set. The ball comes out quick. He's got very good ball placement in the short to intermediate area. He's got good movement in terms of designed movement. Uh, and I think that what we saw last week was Chan Gailey just doing such a good job of playing to all those strengths. It seemed like almost every throw that Tua made last week, he hit that back foot and the ball came out. So when that happens, that means that the reads are defined and the throws are defined. Now, that can happen every throw every week. So that'll be the next step. But last week, it was just, it it, it looked really good. He was incredibly rhythmic. So, so far, again, looking at what we've seen, it does appear that the coordinator in Miami knows the quarterback who seems comfortable with the offensive coordinator calling what he's calling for him. Just that's what it looks like. It looks like there is a match and that this quarterback who has a ton of talent and upside has a coordinator that gets it. That's what you're saying. Well, maybe I'm old school, Rich, probably because I'm old, you know? Right. Um, I think about the Eagles lyric, you know, half the distance takes me twice as long. That's where I am right now. But uh, I'm a believer in coaching, you know, and, and I think that coaching is really important, especially important at the quarterback position, because the reality is there's very few transcendent talents at the quarterback position. Mahomes is one of those guys. Rodgers is. But there's not 50 guys with transcendent talent at the quarterback position. So quarterbacks need to be schemed and that's not a negative i'm not that's not saying something bad a lot of people think that's saying something bad and you're ripping a quarterback tua has a particular skill set and a particular set of traits those particular traits he has at a high level but you have to play to those traits no there's no question about it because you know greg we've had conversations on this show um, and, and you could see it in many other places too. I mean, it's not just indicative of here, but, um, the, the, the number of talented players who have come out of college 
And then there's a merry-go-round either at the head coaching spot or the front office or the coordinator position. And it takes a forever and a day for somebody to get in the right spot. And, you know, Miami hasn't been known for having the right people in place for the talent that they have been ready to have to maybe fill the role of Dan Marino. So that's why I'm trying to drill down here because, right. you know, the, the, the name Chan Gailey certainly – in Dallas, certainly with Jets fans, that wouldn't be the guy that you'd say, you know, we got to get Chan Gailey uh, uh, for Tua. You know, we got to get that guy. So that's where I, I'm I'm wondering, you know, about it. And you're saying, essentially, so far, this is a match, what you're seeing. Yeah, I think he, he's been doing this a long time. I yeah, I know. People can debate coaches, but he's been doing this a long time. And I think, first of all, I think Tua's traits are evident. In other words, I don't think people – struggle to figure out what he is. I think it's very clear as to what his traits are and what his skill set is. I don't think you'd get differing opinions on what he is. Now we're going to see him on the same field, albeit not against each other, uh, Greg Cosell on the Rich Eisen Show, against Justin Herbert, who looks phenomenal. I'm wondering, yep. you going all 22 with this kid, uh, we haven't seen the Chargers get off, uh, get get rid of the jinx that seems to be still uh, over this franchise, uh, certainly at end of games. But w- what are you seeing in Herbert so far? I've been very, very impressed. And I was one guy that, that thought that th- there might be some issues in him uh, transitioning to the league early. Uh, but I think that he's been very impressive. And, and there's a couple of things to me that really stand out. Uh, number one, he's a turn it loose quarterback. He is an aggressive thrower. And I always believe in the NFL to play at a higher level at quarterback, you have to turn it loose. Now, obviously, there's game situations, different game situations dictate throws. But for the most part in the NFL, you're going to have to make throws, and you're going to have to turn it loose, and you're going to have to be aggressive, and you're going to have to make stick throws into tight windows. And this kid, it's in his DNA. This kid turns it loose. And I think he's been probably more accurate than I would have thought based on his college tape, more consistently accurate. You know, he'll miss one or two, all quarterbacks do, but for the most part, his ball placement has been pretty precise. Uh, And I think that he's thrown, and again, this is where coaching comes in, I think he's thrown with a pretty good sense of timing and anticipation, which is something that did not necessarily stand out in his college tape. So, my guess is he's been coached extremely well, that he's probably extremely receptive to coaching. But he's, and, and he's, again, it goes without saying, he's a very high level talent. I mean, I've spoken to some people who think he's just as, if not more talented than Trevor Lawrence. And, and we know that Trevor Lawrence is being spoken about as a generational talent. So, and, and I'm not one of those people that talks like that, Rich, because I think you have to wait till guys play yes. in the NFL to make those kinds of statements. But he's a highly, highly talented guy. Wow. I mean, that is, uh, in terms of evaluating a young quarterback, quite a name to throw out there. And I know... Uh, Trevor Lawrence is on everyone's mind in the uh, New York metropolitan area. I want to put a pin in that for a second, however. <laughs> Please. <laughs> and, and no, no, no. I'm, I'm going to go there, though. I'm going to go there, though. Uh, and, and I want to talk to you about Baker Mayfield, uh, a five and three quarterback coming off of a bye week. Kevin Stefanski saying today, and I want to get this quote correctly, quote, I think he's ready to ascend. What are you seeing out of Mayfield that might be different because he's with Stefanski in this offense over the last yes. eight weeks? What are you seeing? Another perfect example of coaching being critical and scheme helping a quarterback. Mayfield is a quarterback that needs, and and this again is not a negative, he needs the system to rein him in. He needs the system to define the reads and the throws for him. He needs the system to play to his strengths. At his best, he is... a guy with very good ball placement. He's rhythmic. Uh, That's the way he played at Oklahoma. Uh, He's got very quick feet. He's got a compact delivery. He needs to play within the structure of a system. And Stefanski's system does that. It's highly based on play action, play action boot, play action and play action boot define reads and throws, and you allow your quarterback to play that way. And that's absolutely critical. So Stefanski is probably seeing that 
he's probably seeing him grow each week uh, within the concepts that they teach. And the key is ball placement. When he had that, that great game against Cincinnati a few weeks ago, when the numbers were phenomenal, he was so precise with his ball placement, you know, beginning all middle of second quarter. That's the kind of quarterback he must be. And that's going to be a big game, obviously, for Cleveland. Oh, it's a so-called winnable game against Houston this week. They could go to 6-3. and three. Now, Len, let's get to uh, – I'm going to unpin the, the Trevor Lawrence conversation here, Greg. Um, and, again, I, I, I know – look, look, I, I'm not going to ask you to evaluate Trevor Lawrence as an NFL talent. I'm going to flip it a little bit right here. What? Because we've been talking a lot about scheme fit, and coaches can take a player that, uh, that, that, that has yet to blossom professionally with a ton of talent – uh, that the right scheme, right fit is the is is the thing that can unlock success for a player. Give me a scheme that fits Sam Darnold across the NFL. That a, a team might raise well, their hand and say, "Let's let's take let Sam off the Jets' hands." Way. You know, the word talent is thrown around a lot with quarterbacks. Yes, and no one defines what that means, Rich. You know, Sam Darnold has very poor lower body mechanics, and he's not consistently accurate. Okay. So would that, if I told you that, would your immediate response be, that makes him a great talent? No, it would not, Greg. But it would also say to me that he hasn't had the right coaching to tell him, fix this, fix that, or he doesn't have the right confidence level because the scheme doesn't fit. Do we know that? Do we know how he's coached on a daily basis? We're looking at the results. When we have access to the results, we automatically think we know the process. We don't know the process. We don't know how he's coached every day. We're responding to the fact that a larger majority thinks that he's a super talent, and because he's not playing to that level, that it automatically must mean that he's being coached badly. That's basically where we stand. And for whatever reason, and I don't get into this stuff. I know you don't. You're on every day, so you yes. have to talk about these kinds of things. <laughs> For whatever reason, Adam Gase is a whipping boy. So I don't know how he's coached on a daily basis. None of us do. We're not there. So, you, But you're not seeing some sort of maturation for somebody who came in with uh, enough talent to be uh, a third overall selection in the NFL draft. I think right? Sam Darnold, to be a good player okay. in this league, uh, needs – and again, maybe he's getting this and not responding. I don't know. I right. can't speak to that. But I think he needs hard coaching. I think he needs his mechanics to really be cleaned up. Uh, I think that he needs to be much more efficient in the pocket. Uh, I think there's things that can be worked. These are all correctable, by the way, what I'm saying to you. Yes. I'm not saying that he can't be a good player. All I'm saying is that the assumption that he himself is great and that therefore he's being brought down by everybody around him. We know none of that. Last one for you, Greg. Um, I'm sure you blanch at the statement that you hear after a team gets blown out, just throw the tape out, just bury the film, don't look at it. I'm sure I'm sure that I'm sure you're talking about the Bucks now. That's exactly what I'm talking about. What what do you what did you what's to be gleaned from that boat racing that we saw on Sunday night? Well which side of the ball do you want to talk about? Let's talk about the Bucks <laughs> then, I guess, since they're 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 my pick to win the Super Bowl preseason. And what I saw was just so beyond the pale in terms of um, everything. What 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 do, what do you take out of that if you're Tampa or the rest of the league? Well, I guess we'll start with their defense because I think there's a, there's a belief defensively that they didn't do what everybody expected them to do because they've been a team that had blitzed a lot and they played a lot of man coverage. Now, there's a philosophy, and this is now a a philosophy issue. There's a philosophy among many coaches, because I've spoken to coaches, that when you play an offense that's incredibly rhythmic and the ball comes out of the quarterback's hands really quickly, as is the case with Drew Brees, there's a belief that you don't blitz those quarterbacks because you're wasting a player, that you're not going to get there. The second point I would make is this. The, The Saints played a lot out of base personnel which put the Bucks in their base personnel defense. And most pressure schemes in the NFL do not come out of base personnel. They come out of what we call sub, meaning five defensive backs, six defensive backs. So the Saints knew going in that, hey, the ball's going to come out quick with Drew, and we're going to play in base personnel, and we're probably going to limit and minimize the pressure we get because teams don't pressure in those situations. So, again, it's easy on the outside to say they should have blitzed, but this is tactical football. On the other side of the ball, I would say that 
the Bucks O line had a poor performance. I would say that Brady was under a lot of duress. He it was the cumulative effect of pressure. Every quarterback starts to play faster when there's pressure. The first play of the game, they, they called a, a play in which they liked the matchup. They put Godwin in motion. They got him in the slot versus Gardner Johnson on an out route. I'm sure they loved the matchup. And Jordan Bull rushed the rookie tackle worse right back into Brady. And that sort of set the standard for the game. And they couldn't attack man coverage. They, they couldn't get open versus man coverage. And Brady was under constant duress. See, and, and, and uh, I love taking the daily narrative in, in shows like this one, as you referred to uh, that moments ago, Greg, and, and taking the narrative that we discuss and plug it into the hard-bitten world of X's and O's and all 22. What about the sense that Antonio Brown is just the latest uh, shiny, bright, shiny fantasy football object being thrown into the mix in the middle of a season of, of a team that looks like a fantasy team thrown together? Is there a sense that, well, that that's now an issue, too, that it's going to take some time for this to gel? What is the What did the tape tell you on that front? Well, you know, I thought he, he looked pretty good the way he moved. They actually called a shot play to him uh, when they were deep in their own territory. I think I might have been their third possession. And actually, it was a poor throw by Brady. Brady had a chance to take him across the field and give him an opportunity to make a catch. But again, Brady was under duress, had a move. And then when Brady moves, he can't throw the ball deep down the field the way he used to. So that was an opportunity for a big play, and it didn't come about. But certainly Antonio Brown, I thought he looked very spry, very light on his feet. We'll see how this goes. We know that sometimes when good teams have outings like this, that they come back and they come back very strong. This is a good football team with a lot of good players. They're not going to fall apart. They just had a really bad outing, both tactically and individual performance-wise. Greg, you're the best, man. Let's do this. Uh, let's do this right around Thanksgiving, uh, right around, I guess, the three-quarter postmark and, and revisit all of these subjects. Truly appreciate the time. Rich, I really appreciate it. Thank you, my friend. You got it. At Greg Cosell. Follow him on Twitter. I do. It's a great follow. He's a great follow. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.